Ahoy, babies! Welcome aboard. I'm Captain Kyle and captain for today's discussion. Are you ready to discover an old poem called The Seafarer? If you are ready, say, Aye, aye, Captain! Louder! Alright then, let's go! Arr! Ladies, for this discussion, we're going back in time to tackle the poem called The Seafair. In this sailing mates, you're gonna discover the summary, meanings, structures, literary devices used, themes, and the analysis of the poem. But for a little background for this poem, The Seafair is an anonymously written Old English poem. Most scholars believe that the poem is narrated by an elderly seafarer reflecting on his life. There's no definitive answer as to when the seafarer was written. The first copy was discovered in the Exeter book, which is now kept at Exeter Cathedral in England. The poem was written in Old English, also known as the Germanic English, during the Anglo-Saxon period. The Exeter book was written around 940 CE, implying that the poem was written around 450 CE and before the publication of the book. Many other writers have created their own translation of the poem over the years, including Ezra Pound. Pound's translation, on the other hand, strips the original poem of many religious elements. Ahoy there, mates! Allow me to further discuss the summary of the poem called The Seafarer. Are you ready for it? Well then if you are, come on and let's go! The Seafarer's summary must look at the poem as two separate poems combined. The first section speaks of the sea, well, the second speaks of the journey to heaven. At the poem's beginning, the narrator asks the audience to understand and believe his revelations. While he never explains why he chose to become a sailor, the narrator describes at sea as very difficult. He talks about the cold and how it affects his body and soul. Feeling isolated compared to those on land, the narrator continues with his trade, eventually losing the ability to recognize the beauty of bird callings. The narrator states that those who live on land cannot understand the plight of a sailor, but the narrator also claims that he cannot explain why he chose the life he did, yet searches for a home and friendship. However, despite these searches, the narrator admits that a traveler on the sea will never truly find comfort. When summer approaches, the narrator finds himself drawn on the sea again despite knowing the loneliness it holds for him. He exiles himself from humanity to continue his wandering once again. The second half of the poem becomes more theological. The narrator mentions how death will come for everyone, and no one knows how it will come for them specifically. Per old analysts and beliefs, the narrator wishes for glory, but also says that the days of honor and glory are no longer around, and victories must be won in different ways aside from combat. Soon, the narrator laments the need some have for fame and admits that God will not forgive sin at any price. God, the speaker says, must be feared and his commandments must be followed. As the poem nears its end, the narrator asks the audience to remain humble and courageous. God and faith, the narrator says, are more powerful than anyone and any. In contrast to the mystery of living and working at the sea and in the first part, the last part of the poem speaks of the joy and love that await the righteous in the afterlife. The poem ends with the final song, a simple, Amen. And now, let's welcome our crewmates, Rika and Vini, to tackle about the meaning of the poem. I'm going to be back later, guys, so stay tuned. Arr. Thank you, Captain Kyle. Ahoy, mates. I'm Rika, and together with Vinny Bell, we are going to tell you the meaning of the old poem, The Seafarer. The poem, The Seafarer, states that he is telling a story about his travels at sea. Before even giving the details, he emphasizes that the voyages were dangerous and he is often worried for his safety. He often took a nighttime watch, staying alert for rocks or cliffs the waves might toss the ship against. Aside from his fear, he also suffers through the cold, such cold that he feels frozen to his bones. But the poem is not merely about his normal feelings being at sea on a cold night. Despite his anxiety and physical suffering, he relates that his true problem was something else. 
He tells how profoundly lonely it is, how he spends holeless night at sea, listening to bird song instead of laughing and drinking with friends. And it's not just that. He feels that he has no place back in the land. He keeps on traveling, looking for a perfect place to lay anchor. And that's the meaning of the poem, The Seafarer. And now, back to you, Captain Kyle. Thank you, crewmates Vinny and Rika. That is so interesting. And now, let me welcome my another crewmate to discuss the structures and forms of the poem. Crewmate Ivy. Take the stage, crewmate Ivy. Hoi mateys, I am Kruma Idaini and I am discussing the structures and forms of the poem. A 24 line poem entitled The Seafer was written from the first person's point of view. There are two sections, the first of which is the dialectic and the second of which is the didactic. First, what is an elegy? An elegy is a poem that reflects upon death or loss. Traditionally, it contains themes of mourning loss and reflection. However, it can also explore themes of redemption and consolation. How did elegiac poetry originate? Elegiac poetry traces back to the ancient Greek traditions of Elegia. This term is referred to a poetic verse that is phrased in elegiac couplets addressing topics such as loss, death, love, and war. When Romans conquered the Greek lands, they frequently appropriated Greek artistic traditions, and elegiac poetry was no exception. Roman elegies written in Latin address similar topics as Greek elegies but gave special emphasis to erotic or mythological themes. Elegy poems was revived during the Renaissance and eventually made their way into the canon of English literature. The English poets versed their elegies with greater emphasis upon death and loss of a loved one. While somewhat downplaying the reticence of the Roman forebears. What poetic form does an elegy take? Early elegy poetry was typically verse and couplets. But dating back to the 18th century, an elegic stanza has traditionally contained the following characteristics. First, this quatrain or four lines. Number two, it contains an ABAB rhyme scheme. And the third one, each line is written in iambic pentameter. What is didactic? A didactic poem is directly and unusually unapologetical, instructional and informational. It teaches or explains some, such as truth, a moral, a principle, or a process. The English word didactic derives from the Greek didactus, or able to teach or instruct, while modern literary critics have more or less read enough. The didactive poetry, pardon the pun, they are contradicted by the fact that some of the greatest poets wrote didactic verse including Shakespeare. Many of the bard's famous sonnets conclude didactic couplet. The poem can alternatively be read as an individual thoughts, a theatrical monologue, or a conversation between two people. Alliteration can be found throughout the entire poem, but I first noticed that in the line that he on dry land loved it as loved. Another literary device I came across was Kennings which is the practice of using imagery and suggestive direct and indirect references and places of subjects proper for one ah! And that's the structures and poem mateys. Captain Kyle, back to you. Thank you, crewmate Ivy, that was so detailed. And now we have crewmate Andrea and Bea for the literary devices used in the poem. Aye, aye, crewmates. Hoi, mates! I'm Baya, together with my crewmate, Andrea. We are discussing the literary devices used in the poem, The Sea Fair. Let's go, mates! In order to bring richness and clarity in the text, poets use literary devices. With the use of literary devices, texts become more appealing and meaningful. 
in the poem The Seafarer, the poet employed various literary devices to emphasize the intended impact of the poem. Following are the literary devices used in the poem. First, metaphor. When an implicit comparison is drawn between two objects or persons, it is called a metaphor. For example, in the poem, the metaphor employed is that leaps at the fools who forget their God. In this line, the author believes that on the day of judgment, God holds everything accountable. He says that those who forget him and their lives should fear his judgment. The line serves as a reminder to worship God and face his death and wrath. Second one is alliteration. Alliteration is the repetition of consonant sound at the beginning of every word at close intervals. For instance, in the poem, when wonderful things were work among them, there is a repetition of doubly sound that creates a pleasing rhythm and enhances the musical effect of the poem. So Summer Sentinel, the Coco sings. There is a repetition of S in sound in verse. Third one is personification. Attributing human qualities to non-living things is known as personification. In the poem, the poet employed personification in the following lines. The soul strip of its flesh knows nothing, of sweetness or sour, feels no pain. These lines describe the fleeting nature of life, and the speaker preaches about God. He says that as a person, their senses fade, and they lost their ability to feel pain as they lost the ability to appreciate and experience the positive aspects of life. The fourth one is anaphora, the repetition of two or more words at the beginning of two or more lines in poetry is called anaphora. In the poem, the poet says, those powers have vanished, those pleasures are dead. The repetition of the word those at the beginning of the above line is anaphora. In the above lines, the speaker believes that there are no more glorious emperors and rulers. The world is wasted away. He also asserts that instead of focusing on the pleasures of the earth, one should devote himself to God. Ahoy, mates! I'm crewmate Andrea. To continue what crewmate Bea discussed, here's the another literary devices used in the poem. Simile. Simile is when two different objects are compared to one another to understand the meaning. The use of the word like and as is called a simile. For example, in the poem, imagery is employed as, quote, the world's honor ages and shrinks bent like the man who molded, quote. In the above line, the readers draw attention to the increasingly impure and corrupt nature of the world. He asserts that man, by essence, is sinful, and this fact underlines his need for God. Next is polysyndeton, the employment of conjunction in a quick succession, repeatedly in verse in known as polysyndeton. In the poem, the poet employed polysyndeton as Quote, and forth in sorrow and fear and pain. Quote. The speaker describes the experiences of the seafarer and accompanies it with his suffering to establish melancholic tone of the poem. Next is hyperbola. Hyperbola is the exaggeration of an event or anything. For instance, in the poem, Quote, showed me suffering in a hundred ships in a thousand parts. Quote. In these lines, the speaker describes his experiences as a seafarer in a dreadful and prolonged tone. Next is Cicera. It is a pause in the middle of a line. The pause can sometimes be coincided. For example, quote, for a soul overflowing with sin, and nothing hidden on earth rises to heaven. Go. In the above line, the post stresses the meaningless of material possessions and the way God's judgment will be unaffected by the wealth one possesses on earth. And that the literary devices used in the poems, matey. Back to you, Captain Kyle.
Ahoy, Andrea and Bea for discussing the literary devices used in the poem. And now, let's welcome also my crewmates, Rezel and Chisel, for they will be discussing the themes of the poem. Hey, yay, Matthias! Together with my crewmate, Chisel, we're going to discuss the themes of the poem. Let's go, Matthias! The first theme of the poem, The Seafarer, is alienation and loneliness. The first part of the poem is an elegy. It generally portrays sorrow and longing for the better days of times past. To conjure up its theme of longing, the seeker immediately thrusts the reader deep into a world of exile, hardship, and loneliness. The speaker of the poem describes his feelings of alienation in terms of physical privation and suffering. My feet were cast in icy bands, bound with frost, with frozen trees, and the hardship grown around my heart. He says that his feet was immobilized to the hull of his open air ship when he is sailing across the sea. His feet are sized by the cold, and the cold corresponds to the sufferings that cause his mind. The tragedy of the loneliness and alienation is not evident for those people whose culture promotes brutally self-made individualists that struggle alone without assistance from friends or family. The world of Anglo Sassons was bound together with a web of relationships of both family and friends. For the people of that time, the isolation and exile that the sufferer suffers in the poem is a kind of mental death. An exile and the wanderer, because of his social separation, is the weakest person, as mentioned in the poem. Without any human connection, the person can easily be stricken down by age, illness, or the enemy's sword. Another theme of the poem, the seafarer, is human condition. Despite the fact that the seafarer is in miserable seclusion at sea, his inner longing propels him to go back to the source of sorrow. The anonymous poet of the poem urged that the human condition is universal in so many ways that it figures across culture and true time. The human condition consists of a balance between loving and longing. For instance, people often find themselves in a love-hate condition with a person, job, or many other things. The same is the case with the seafarer. His condition is miserable yet his heart longs for the voyage. The poet asserts that those who are living in the safe cities and use the pleasures of songs and wines are unable to understand the push food that this seafarer tolerates. However, the character of the seafarer is in the metaphor of contradiction and uncertainties that, the, that are inherent within person and life. For instance, the poet says that the joys of God are prevent with life, where life itself fades quickly into the earth. The wealth of the world neither reaches to heaven nor remains. The lines are suggestive of the resignation and sadness. These lines echo throughout Western literature, whether it deals with the Christian contempt movie or deals with the trouble of existentialists regarding the meaningless of life. The response of the seafarer is somewhere between the opposite poles. The last theme of the poem is memory and reminiscence. For the seafarer, the greater source of sadness lies in the disparity between the glorious worlds of the past when compared to the present fallen world. The literature of the Icelandic Norse, the continental Germans, and the British Saxons preserve the Germanic heroic era from the periods of great tribal migration. Just like the Greeks, the Germanics had a great sense of a passing of a golden age. The speaker longs for the more exhilarating and wilder time before civilization was brought by Christendom. Even though the poet continuously appeals to the Christian God, he also longs for the heroism of pagans. This explains why the speaker of the poem is in danger and the pain of the settled life in the city. In short, one 
can say that the dissatisfaction of the speaker makes him long for an adventurous life. And those are the theme of the poem, The Seeker. Thank you, Mattis, for listening to our discussion. Back to you, Captain Kyle. Aye, Kruwe's resolent chisel. That was an outstanding theme of the poem. And now, for the last part of this discussion, Mattis, let's welcome our crewmate, Marge and Angelica, for the analysis of the poem. Aye, aye, Captain Kyle. Hello, ladies. I'm crewmate Margin, together with crewmate Angelica. We're going to discuss the analysis of the poem, The Seafarer. Let's go, ladies. The Seafarer is a type of poem called an elegy. Elegies are poems that mourn or express grief about something, often death. In this poem, the narrator grieves with permanence of life, the fact that he and everything he knows will be eventually be gone. However, some scholars argue the poem is a sacramental poem, meaning a poem that imparts religious wisdom. Part of the debate stems from the fact that the end of poem is so different from the first hundred lines. In fact, Pound and others who translated the poem left out and ended entirely. Example given the part that turns to contemplation on an eternal afterlife. If you look at the poem in its original Old English, also called Anglo-Saxon, you can analyze the form a meter. Here is a sample. Admittedly, that probably looks like a gibberish to you, but within that gibberish, you may have noticed that the lines don't seem to all have the same number of syllables. However, they do each have four stresses which are emphasized syllables. Each line is also divided in half with a pause, which is called a tesera. Like a lot of Anglo-Saxon poetry, the superior pauses alliteration of the stressed syllables. This is when syllables start with the same sound. Every first stress after the tesera starts with the same letter as one of the stressed syllables before the tesera. Look at example. You can see the alliteration in the lines. How are you, Matis? I'm your crewmate, Angelica, and I'm going to follow the analysis of the poem. Are you ready? You should be ready. Let's go! So, the seafarer analysis needs to look at both halves of the poem, each distinct but important to the final message. The ocean in the poem symbolizes the world outside our homes. The narrator makes various distinctions between those who have the comforts of a home and family in the cold, miserable life of a sailor. Those who live in land and never explore are happy that they cannot understand the plight of those who, like the narrator, seek something else besides the comforts of food and love. The first part seems only to show the wonderlust of a seafarer, but combined with the second half, it is a poem trying to tell others that they will never find what they were looking for at the material things. The narrator spends his life at sea looking for something he cannot describe, yet hating the experience. In the second half, he admits that the thing that people seek is God, though they may not know it. The seafarer is a sequential poem, a type of poem also found in the Old Testament, and sometimes called the poetic books. These books deal with the spiritual life of the Israelites. The poetic books and the seafarer strive to teach through story, so, how you made this, that's all for today. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have learned something.